our next guest has an incredible and moving story and it's never been told before. He was the sole witness to one of the most tragic events in recent memory. It was the day that we lost an Australian icon. It was the shock news that made world headlines. We begin in Australia where local reports are saying their famed crocodile hunter Steve Irwin has died. Steve Irwin, who braved the jaws of crocodiles, killed by the freak flick of a stingray's tail. That fateful day remains etched into the memories of many, including Steve's most trusted companion. And where would I be without me best mate and me right hand man, Justin? He was the only person underwater with Steve that day and eight years on, he's ready to tell his story for the first time. Justin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Ida. Steve called you his right-hand man, so you clearly had a very special relationship. We did, yeah. 15 years of travelling and working and being in dangerous situations and hotels and aeroplanes and airports, yeah. We, we were very close. And Justin, I think all of us remember uh, where we were when we heard the news that Steve Irwin had died. Yep. What is it that you remember of that day? Um, I remember it really very clearly. A um, bit of background, we've been working on a documentary called Ocean's Deadliest, so we're basically looking at the deadliest creatures in the ocean, sharks and sea snakes and blue ringed octopus and box jellyfish and all the things that would normally make people cringe. This was what Steve loved. So he's very excited by it. We're about eight days in. We'd uh, been filming with crocodiles, I think, and sea snakes. We'd been milking sea snakes. And we were looking for tiger sharks on this particular day. And so we'd had a bit of bad weather. Steve was like a caged tiger when he couldn't do something, particularly on a boat. And so he said, let's go and do something. So we jumped in the inflatable and off we went to look for something to do. And, and so then what did you do? You were standing, the two of you were in quite shallow water, weren't you, when you were um, filming? We'd only been stingrays. motoring for a few minutes and uh, we found a, a massive stingray. Fantastic. We are actually looking for something to shoot for another project and um, we'd swum with stingrays many times before. They're, they're not usually aggressive, not, are they? Not at all. This one was extraordinarily large. It was eight foot wide, massive bull ray. Um, so it was very impressive. So we're only in chest deep water. We slipped over the side of the, the inflatable. We stood up, we chatted about what we were going to do. We always made a bit of a plan when we were filming underwater. And we just started shooting. We'd been shooting it for a few minutes. Um, stingrays are normally very calm. If they don't want you to be around them, they'll swim away. They're very fast swimmers. A um, Couple of minutes, we'd been filming. We stood up, we said, what shots do we want to get? We always tried to put the animal between Steve and I underwater so the animal was in the foreground. And um, we stood up and said, uh, one last shot, you swim up from behind the animal and, uh, and I'll try and get a shot of it swimming away. And so that's what so we did. So that's Steve swimming up and you're getting the shot. And what happened? Well, I had the camera on. I thought this is going to be a great shot. It's going to be in the doco for sure. Fantastic. And all of a sudden it propped on its front and started stabbing wildly with its tail. Hundreds of strikes in a few seconds. They're, um, they're incredibly powerful animals and they've been on the planet for... 60 million years. So they've survived because they are, they're survivors. Mm. It probably thought that Steve's shadow was a tiger shark, which feeds on them very regularly. And so it started to attack him. I panned with the camera as the stingray swam away. I didn't even know it had caused any damage. It wasn't until I panned the camera back that Steve was standing in a huge pool of blood that uh, I realised something had gone wrong. And what did you think? What did you do next? Well, it's it's crazy what goes through your head but mm. the first thing I thought of was we've got to get out of the water because we're attracting sharks. Mm. Was and Steve able to swim at that point with, or, or did you have to help him? It was, it was seconds but it felt like forever because time really did slow down mm. for me there um, and again contrary to what I'd read in the papers and everything I heard at the time which was just incorrect um, the stingray barb was a blade about a foot extending out of the middle part of its tail. So it's not at the tip of the mm -hmm. tail, it's, it's about in the middle. It's a bit like a fingernail. And the other half is embedded in the tail of the stingray. It didn't come out. Steve didn't pull it out. It's a jagged, sharp barb. And it went through his chest like a hot knife through butter. Mm. He thought it had punctured his lung and he stood up out of the water and screamed, it's punctured me lung. Mm. Within a few seconds, the, uh, the inflatable that had been motoring about 30 metres away was there. So we threw him into the boat and um, assessed the situation for about five seconds. He had a two foot, uh, about a two inch 
wide injury over his heart with blood and fluid coming out of it. And we thought we've got to get him back to the, the boat as fast as we can. Was he talk sorry, Jeff, was he talking to you then? He was in extraordinary pain. They've got a, a venom on their barb and so it was, I'm sure it was excruciatingly painful. Um, he had an extraordinary threshold for pain so I knew that when he was, when he was in pain that it must have been painful. I don't, he obviously didn't know that it had punctured his heart but he knew that it had punctured his lung. He was having trouble breathing. But, I mean, even if we'd been able to get him into an emergency ward at that moment, we probably wouldn't have been able to save him because the damage to his heart was massive. So as we're motoring back, I'm screaming at one of the other crew in the boat to put their hand over the wound. And I'm, um, we're saying to him things like, think of your kid, Steve, hang on, hang on, hang on. And he just sort of calmly looked up at me and said, I'm dying. Mm. And that was the last thing he said. What, what a, a thing to hear from one of your closest mates. What was going through your mind when he was looking up at you saying that? I, I'm not sure, to be honest. I, I don't think I realised how serious it was. I didn't know that it had pierced his heart. I thought maybe it's just pierced his lung and we've got a good chance of saving him. He probably lapsed into unconsciousness, even though his eyes were open somewhere in those 30 seconds, getting him back to Croc 1, the, the mothership. And we literally put him on the duckboard and I started CPR on him straight away. But there was no hope, was there? There's always hope. Mm. I mean, we, we hoped for a miracle. So we, you know, I literally did CPR on him for over an hour before we got him to Low Isles where the helicopter arrived and the medics came. Um, but then they pronounced him dead within 10 seconds of looking at him. Did he say anything else to you? No, that was it. That were his final words. Mm. And, I mean, you would have been in the past in a lot of sort of dangerous situations with Steve. Did it surprise you that it was something like a stingray, that this is what was going to happen? It was shocking. I mean, it was probably always going to be something weird with Steve. I mean, a crocodile or a shark, mm. or, he was so good with animals, nothing was going to get him. You know, we always thought it would be something, you know, we thought he was going to live forever, but it would always be a crazy, silly accident. And as it turns out, that's exactly what it was. Mm. Justin, we're going to talk more with you after the break. Thank you so much already for sharing some of this remarkable experience. We will be back soon and we're going to find out how Justin got back on his feet after losing his very good friend, Steve Owen.